So good morning all, and uh, welcome to another edition of Rift from the Headlines. Uh, this one uh, just seemed too good to pass up uh, and decide to strike while the iron is hot uh, as we address why did the lawyer keep putting his hand on his head? And uh, you see a picture of it uh, on the source sheet. And uh, this is of course referencing uh, a news item from uh, last week. Uh, we don't like to talk politics here, uh, but why did Trump's impeachment lawyer, David Schoen, keep putting his hand on his head? That is the uh, headline from the JTA uh, online news source uh, from uh, last week. And uh, they see it was reported uh, widely uh, in the general as well as Jewish uh, press. The Senate convened Tuesday for historic first former President Donald Trump's second impeachment. David Schoen, one of Trump's impeachment lawyers, already asked and then withdrew his request for Trump's trial to pause for the Jewish day of rest. Was the fact that he covered his head while drinking also because he's an Orthodox Jew? We didn't ask Schoen, but we can say almost certainly yes. So why wasn't he wearing a kippah or another head covering as many observant Jewish men do? I just wasn't sure if it was appropriate. Frankly, Schoen said after hearing a CNN reporter who asked him why he did not wear a kippah. I didn't want to offend anyone. It's just an awkward thing and people stare at it. Avoiding stares was Schoen's goal. He did not succeed. Even observant Jews expressed confusion about why Schoen repeated his hand motion every time he drank. Religious law only requires a blessing before one's first bite or sip and after eating or drinking is completed. And using your own hand to cover your head doesn't really count as a valid covering according to most orthodox interpretations of halakha. So why did Schoen repeatedly cover his head with his own hand? Some claim to see Schoen using a bottle cap to cover his head rather than just his hand, which would present its own halakhic issues. Others offered another suggestion drawn from their own experience as regular kippah wearers. Schoen could be displaying a reflex to keep his usually their kippah from sliding off his head. Uh, all sorts of uh, conjecture and suggestions and uh, implications relating to Jewish law. Uh, and we're gonna try and cover uh, a lot of them uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of understanding, uh, trying to understand Schoen, uh, we only can rely on his own words. Uh, he did say in subsequent interviews uh, as recently as over the weekend that uh, his hand was there in connection with uh, making a bracha and covering what's hand went with regards to uh, eating and drinking. But uh, let's go to the videotape, or not the videotape of him covering his head. Let's go to the, uh, we'll see what the sources tell us with regards to uh, head covering uh, in Jewish practice. And uh, uh, we're going to be focusing on the idea of the yarmulke or kippah as it pertains uh, to men. Uh, just a word of introduction with regards to, to, to women. Uh, we, we, there does not seem to be a, uh, an ex it doesn't seem to be a, uh, the idea of women covering their head for ritual reasons the same way as men for the most part. Uh, there are certain references. Maimonides talks about the idea of women uh, covering their head for prayer the same way as men, but for the most part, uh, women's uh, head coverings uh, are within the domain of the discussion of married women covering their hair. Um, you know, the, the idea of uh, men covering their head has more to do with the divine awareness, uh, and it has, is uh, often the case. Uh, th there seems to be an expectation that women have a, a greater spiritual sensitivity and divine awareness and don't need to be reminded all the time that God is above them uh, the same way men do. I sometimes like to say it's analogous to the fact that for the most part, it's the, my son who needs to be reminded to pick his clothes off the floor and then not my daughters, right? They, women need fewer instructions and more intuitive uh, than men. So that uh, uh, we'll, we'll be focusing, our sources are gonna be uh, related to men covering their hair. Uh, their hair is for, uh, for religious purposes. So let's jump right in, in terms of uh, where this, uh, this is addressed. Uh, we don't talk about the idea, we don't encounter that much head covering in terms of the Torah, in terms of, um, in terms of ritual uh, covering within the Torah itself. There are times Moshe is wearing a mask. Uh, there are times that, um, that there is kind of, a, there is a head covering, the Kohen wore a hat. Um, 
but for religious purposes, one of the earliest uh, in one of the, the sources that gives us some indication as to what we're trying to accomplish with the head covering comes from the Talmud in Kiddushin. Talmud Kiddushin, source number one, Rav Huna, son of Rav Yoshua, would not walk four cubits with an uncovered head. He said, the divine presence is above my head. Right? He felt that he, it was the respectful thing to do to have a head covering uh, when encountering the divine. And he felt that uh, it's important to uh, recognize that and show honor and respect by covering the head. Uh, because he had a, it, it was a, a function of his uh, God awareness. Um, we, we read about in the uh, we read in the book of Psalms a very well-known verse Hashem I put God before me always uh, Rabbi Mark Angel uh, tells a humorous rabbinic anecdote about a uh, rabbi of a of a of a popular in, in, in large synagogue uh, one of his members left and wasn't there for a while. And the rabbi captain him and says, where, where are you davening? You're not in shul these days. He's like, well, I went to a smaller shul, um, you know, where I feel it's a little bit more intimate. And the, his previous rabbi was like, why would you go there? We're such a great shul. Why do you have to go somewhere else? He's like, well, uh, you know, I, I feel more in, inspired, um, a, a certain more divine awareness. And, and the rabbi there has taught me how to read people's minds. Uh, and his former rabbi says, wow, that's pretty good. Can you read my mind? Um, um, and uh, and uh, so he said, to what verse uh, am I thinking about in the, in the Bible? And his former congregant said, I place uh, uh, God before me always. And his former rabbi says, no, that's not the verse I'm thinking of. And his uh, former congregant said, well, that's the reason I left your synagogue because you're supposed to place God in front of you always and there and you're not uh, having God in front of you always. So I went to a place where I feel it is more like that. A little bit of what we would call an Yiddish a shtach. Uh, but uh, that God awareness is, being, uh, is what Rav Huna was displaying. I got, feel God's presence always. I want to do something. I want to show respect. I cover the head. Um, so there, there, there's the God awareness component uh, and, and this does tie in with the biblical imagery, and we mentioned before the idea of Moshe's, you know, face covering when encountering the, the divine. So there's this idea of uh, of coverage when we have uh, uh, when we encounter the divine. It's a, a sign of humility before the Lord. There's also uh, the fact that this type of behavior of God awareness may divert and direct our interpersonal behavior. So Gemara and Shabbos on Kuf Nun Vav Amir Beis 156b uh, tells a story of Rav Nachman by Yitzchak. Uh, and there they're talking about Ein Mazal Yisrael. This is a very famous expression of Talmud that the Jews don't depend on luck or the stars, the constellations, Mazal. Uh, they don't control the Jewish nation. As Chaldean astrologers told Rav Nachman by Yitzchak's mother, your son will be a thief. So that would seem to imply that the astrologers are saying the stars will determine his future. She did not allow him to uncover his head. She said to her son, cover your head so that the fear of heaven will be upon you and pray for divine mercy. He did not know why she said this to him. Right? Every day before he leaves, his mother uh, tells him to wear, uh, to cover his head. One day he was sitting and studying beneath a palm tree that did not belong to him and the cloak fell off his head. You know, he didn't have one of those keeper clips or something like that. He lifted his, his eyes and saw the palm tree. He was overcome by impulse, climbed up and detached a bunch of dates with his teeth. So the second his head covering fell off, fell off he seems to give in towards the natural inclination that the Chaldean astrologer said he would possess and his thievery uh, emerges. It's the losing of his head covering, which was this divine awareness. So how is it that Jews aren't subject to the, uh, the stars? Because it's our connection to God, which means we direct our own potential. Now, if we lose that focus on God, are we then subject to the uh, capricious nature of the stars? Uh, in this story, it seems to indicate yes. And therefore, it is important uh, for uh, the, the, the child uh, here to uh, always have the head covered so that the, the divine awareness will lead to his uh, overcoming the natural inclination to steal and therefore fulfill the quote unquote destiny that had been predicted for him. And so it's not only about God awareness, but it's that God awareness which helps refine the character 
uh, and then uh, properly focuses the individual on their responsibilities uh, towards God. Uh, I, I always um, uh, am reminded uh, of the teaching of uh, how did we know that our patriarch, our forefather Jacob, uh, wore a hat? And so the Torah says, Vayetze Yaakov. Yaakov went out. Would Yaakov go out without wearing a hat? Of course he wore a hat. He went out. He had to wear a hat. Now, it's the kind of circular uh, reasoning and logic. Of course, it's not true uh, that we know he wore a hat because he went out, but it becomes so second nature to expect that uh, going out, uh, the Jew covers the head uh, in an effort to uh, remind, remember that one is above. So there, there, there's this God awareness, there's the refinement of character, um, there's the religious element. Uh, Maimonides introduces a third component uh, into the idea of a head covering, and this is uh, on the source number three. It's a certain modesty. They don't uncover their heads or their bodies. They dress a certain way. There's a certain modesty involved in covering up uh, including wearing a hat, you know, maybe instead of modesty is a certain formality, it's a certain, it's a certain type of attire, uh, which, um, which is uh, part and parcel of uh, appropriate dress. Remember, he's talking about talmidei chachamim, um, you know, which will beg the question, you know, the, the behaviors that we are seeing, right, it was uh, Rav Huna, one of the Talmudic rabbis, uh, it is a story that's told about um, Rab Nachman Bar Yitzhak, another Talmudic rabbi. And here Maimonides is saying that this is, the head covering is also the realm of the Talmud Chacha. So is it just about these more prominent, special, spiritual, holy, knowledgeable people? Well, in fact, source number four, uh, Tash Beitz, uh, talks about this idea about head covering. And he says... At the end of the source, zehu midat chasidut. This is a pious trait. This isn't an everyday trait. This is a pious trait. So that maybe there is a certain, uh, the, 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 the average Joe uh, isn't necessarily covering their uh, head regularly. It's those who are more spiritually sensitive, those who are more uh, spiritually accomplished, those who have reputations uh, to act a certain way. Those are the ones who have to uh, uh, dress this way. The average Jew may not necessarily have to cover uh, their head uh, for any of these reasons. So that's promoting, that, that's the, the laying out the issue. It seems that from a Talmudic perspective, it's about God awareness. It's about refinement of character. It's about a certain type of uh, expectation for how the scholar or leader will act. And it being understood as something that is midat chasidut. This is not normative behavior. This is special behavior, refined behavior, not necessarily for anyone and everyone. So that's how it's laid out from the Talmudic sources. And that's how, where things stand um, before we get to the Shulchan Aruch, before codes uh, of Jewish law uh, start to emerge. Questions, comments, reactions. All right, as always, feel free to uh, write in the chat if you're or on mute, just ask a question. But w once we get to codes of Jewish law and you know, certain types of uh, behavior uh, it, it becomes normative, even if it wasn't necessarily always the domain of everyone. That was actually one of the critiques against the Shulchan Aruch, code of Jewish law, in that it presented everything without the ability to create differentiation between situations, and individuals, and cases. Because if we, for example, this is one of those cases. The Talmud seems to indicate uh, certain cases or examples of people who cover their head, but there doesn't seem to have any type of designation that this is what Jewish men are supposed to do. The Shulchan Aruch is trying to collect all the laws and it creates a code of Jewish law, which then ultimately would standardize what everyone is doing. And no longer, you, know, you don't have the same type of personality uh, that exists when understanding the original sources and being able to say, oh, he did that because of this reason, he did that for this reason. A code, uh, that's what a code is supposed to do, is there to provide uh, guidance and laws and it's not really meant to be questioned or 
understood or differentiated. And therefore, Shohan Aruch, uh, the very beginning of uh, the laws of daily living in the second chapter, Asur leilech bikomazikufa velo yeilech dalad amos begilui vosh. You're not allowed to walk upright, proud, or arrogantly, and you shouldn't walk for amos with an uncovered head. That's how it presents as a certain positioning, a certain way we hold ourselves. Now, it is, it, it's important to note, it says, Asur leilech bikomazikufa. It's forbidden to walk in an arrogant, stiff, backed, straight way. One is meant to be more uh, subservient to God, and that's supposed to be reflected uh, in one's uh, posture, right? Not necessarily to cause any type of uh, rounding of the shoulders or the like, but one isn't supposed to walk around with, you know, one's chest out and I'm the greatest. It says that's forbidden. It doesn't say, Asur leilech, thou and Amos begilu rosh. It doesn't say it's forbidden to walk for Amos with an uncovered head. It says, Velo, don't do it. And there's a very, you have to be sensitive to that distinction. F forbidden and don't do it. So forbidden would mean it's absolutely not allowed. Lo yelech is means you shouldn't. And this is going to be the jumping off point for the conversation as to what is required in a head covering, what's preferred in a head covering and the like. Because as we saw in the Talmud, the Talmud seems to be describing, uh, you know, as the Tashbates uh, summarized, the behavior of certain rabbis who are living their lives or acting a certain way based on their status and their stature isn't necessarily for the average Joe. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch is providing a code of Jewish law that everyone is meant to access and uh, can't say it's forbidden to walk without an uncovered head because the Talmud doesn't say so, but is trying to provide the right guidance for as many people as possible that they shouldn't be going out with heads uncovered. Again, in the laws of prayer, Source number six, Yesh Omrim, there are those who say, You're not allowed to mention God's name with an uncovered head. Again, it doesn't say it is abs categorically forbidden. It says, Yesh Omrim. Yesh Omrim, Sheyesh Limchos, Shalobi Kanes Beves Hakneses Begilu Rosh. You should uh, protest and ensure that no one enter into a, a shul with an uncovered head. So here we begin to see the uh, development of what's considered to be normative behavior, the normative behavior of a Jew going outside, covering one's head, and a Jew always covering one's head when mentioning God's name. Get back to our rip from the headlines example, right? If you're in one place, you don't have to cover your head, but if you're saying a blessing, Right, then you do have to manage to cover uh, one's head. And therefore, you know, it wouldn't be surprising for someone who's sensitive to this usually, to when taking a drink of water and having to say a blessing, having to uh, cover one's head. Um, but we have to start, we have to understand some of the specifics. What happens if you can't? What if, is there a, is there a hierarchy? Is, there, is it a hat? Is it a yarmulke? Can you put your hand on your head? What are the, the differences? So let's, dig a little bit more deeply into how this is being done. Also, we understand it, it as a matter of piety. We understand the, the covering the head as an activity of God awareness. Is there any other reason why this may become more uh, popular or more universal, right? We said the Shulchan Aruch is introducing the idea of the Jewish men covering their head as normative behavior. Is that just, encouragement to have more God awareness, or is there something else at play here? So first we look at the Vilna Gon, right? The Vilna Gon who was someone who uh, uh, did, was not a big fan of new practices that weren't anchored in the Talmud. And he says in source number seven, Klala de Milsa, ain isur klal berosh migula. There's no for, nothing forbidden about an uncovered head. Rak lifnei hagdolim. Well, just for you know the, the greater people, the, the more accomplished scholars and, and, and holy people. And also during Davening, as Nachon Hadavar Mitzan Hamusar. It's appropriate to cover your head. You're talking to God, show a little humility. And other people who are involved in holy activities all day, of course, they should have their heads covered. So the Vilna Gon is go rolling things back. He's looking at the Shulchan Aruch. He's not 
all that impressed with the need for everyone to cover their head uh, all the time. It says during davening, it makes sense, it's appropriate. The rest of the day, uh, not, not, not so much. Um, so in a sense, you know, not being as, as direct and forward uh, as the Shulchan Aruch. And you know, if we look at the historical development of Jews covering their heads, uh, we, we recognize that in, in many ways, it, among Ashkenazim, it's become much more entrenched regularly than among Sephardim, that generally when they're in shul, cover their heads, but don't have the same culture of wearing, uh, of covering their heads outside of shul the same way. Now we're going to have to try to stop and understand what's the role of the outside culture in terms of covering one's head uh, outside of religious activities. Um, and we're going to see that in a minute. You know, part of it is the culture in terms of uh, co head coverings, what was the typical culture like in terms of head coverings, right? You know, so for, you know, you look, you look at the, you know, pictures of uh, baseball games in the 1920s and all the men were wearing hats. And, you know, so, you know, if you, if you have like a Hasidic kid looking at that, they think, oh, look, all the people went to the Yankee Stadium in the 1920s were Hasidim. See, they're all wearing hats like us. That's not, obviously not the case. So, uh, you know, certainly style and, 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 and culture will, will, will factor into this. But from a religious perspective, we've seen so far some of the sources in the Talmud about it being a religious ideal. Uh, seemingly that this would be for not for everybody. Shulchan Aruch as a code of Jewish law tries to make it for everybody. Vilna Gon reminds us that it really isn't for everybody. It's only, it, it, only ideally, it's an ideal in, in, in religious, uh, during religious activities. So if we would leave things there, there doesn't necessarily be strong grounding for Jewish men to cover their head except when they are in shul. It, what changed? What, what, what else can be introduced into the discussion? Right? Why, why, do, why would men wear yarmulkes much more commonly in, the, in, in large parts of the Orthodox community today than before? Any thoughts as to what may have changed? The full recognition of real, but way before that, the, the sort of pride. I mean, okay. to wear, yeah, the pride in in not being uncomfortable and the, you know. All right. So I think I think I I think Jewish pride is more of the conversation. I think Jewish pride pro is probably a more contemporary part of the conversation because much of Jewish history, Jews didn't have much pride, uh, you know, just in terms of the situation they lived in. Um, I think we, we, we at the same time, we have to kind of bridge the gap between the Vilna Gones analysis, which is very much in line with the Talmud that it's only for the ideal versus how does this become normative? Um, we, you know, in, in terms of, you know, how do we bridge that gap? What, what, what ra rationale can we give to encourage everybody to wear a yarmulke? You know, so for example, maybe it's part of the uniform, right? You know, this is what, this is, you know, somehow maybe a, uni a Jewish uniform developed among men to cover their head. Or it seems that an early uh, form of that Jewish pride emerged from trying not to be like the non-Jew. And so Rabbi David uh, Siegel, the commentary of the Taz on the Shulchan Aruch, 18th century, uh, start when he's addressing you know, the idea of head covering, says, Venera at least the source number eight, Sheesh Isur Gamor. Right. He thinks that there really is a prohibition in an uncovered head. Because now there's a law amongst the non-Jew. As soon as they go indoors, they take off the hat. So this idea of an uncovered head becomes very much following in their non-Jewish paths. Rabbi. Especially if covering the head is a reflection, rep represents God awareness. Okay, let me, let me, let me do my class, please. Even more, wow. therefore, You're interrupting even more me every so, minute. Therefore, wow. even more so, uh, there should be the responsibility to not be like the non Jews. The non Jews have become the have become known by their uncovered heads and covering one's head is a sign of uh, God awareness. So, you know, put one and one together and you have three, you have now a, a more uh, mandated requirement, a more solidified requirement. 
And so the truth is, if you walk around with a hand on your head, you're clearly doing something uh, more of a covering than the non-Jews and their bareheadedness. So because you're, you're doing something that you don't want to be bareheaded, so you put something on your head. But this is not a head covering, and we're going to see that uh, we're going to see in a minute in the Mishnah Bura that there's a whole discussion that the hand on the head is sufficient as a symbol, but it's not really a covering. Uh, it's not considered a covering for the purposes of, uh, of of showing one's respect and reverence for God in this situation. So here, the Taz introduces uh, the, the idea of. Uh, that, that the head covering, the wearing of the yarmulke is the anti, uh, is the taking a stance against the non-Jewish culture of bareheadedness. Yes, Elliot. I'm sorry, I, I was never a lover of the yarmulke or the kippah, but the reality is um, when Moshe Rabbeinu approached Hashem, he talked about take the feet, but nothing was mentioned about the head or Avraham. But it's mm -hmm. also interesting that the Pope, the Pope and Cardinals, they have a covering over their heads like a yarmulke, which is interesting to note that there's some type of connection between a higher up and reminding you that there is a higher up. I right, personally, so I personally never was never in love with it because I love Hashem. And whether so I put my hand over like he did in the, uh, the Senate and mm -hmm. do a quick bracha for the water, to me is more symbolic than anything. Okay, well, well, so of, course gonna... now, of course now all lawyers, if they want to be a lawyer, will be doing that when they drink water. <laughs> The uh, you know, it's, it's like you know, it becomes a it becomes Hopefully. a mystical Hopefully. it becomes a mystical uh, it becomes a mystical activity. No, so I correct. Look, I think that the the the, the idea first you mentioned the popes is if if you've ever seen uh, how uh, they worship they all, they actually take the yarmulke they, whatever it's not called the yarmulke, but they take the skull cap off when they're involved in some of the parts of the service. They actually take it off when they're davening to God. Um, you know, you can uh, you can you can see that if you ever seen a televised mass or anything like that. But it, it, it's not they cover their head, but it's almost they uncover it when they're coming close to God to kind of to in a sense remove any type of uh, barrier on some level. But the the, the what, what the Taz introduces is this idea that you know we, we can capture it by saying what's that 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 bareheadedness is non-Jewish. So if bareheadedness is non-Jewish. If you're bareheaded, then you're more like the non-Jews. So if you want to show your, if you want to show your Judaism, and not only show your Judaism, if you want to avoid violating, following in the footsteps of the past of the non-Jew, you're going to have to cover your head. It's moving it away from a, a kind of re reverence for God. It's moving away from, uh, you know, it's moving away from uh, uh, the, the 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 idea of it being a religious. Uh, ideal and it's it, it's it, it's giving more weight to this being a rule jews need to cover their heads so they're not like the non-jews this actually reflected itself in some of the early reform synagogues uh, that that emerged in, in in germany and then the one they started in, in the united states also reform synagogues were known as you, you could not wear a kippah in the reform synagogue you had to because they were very interested in creating recreating the gentile worship experience and the Gentile worship experience was bareheaded. It was also very solemn and quiet and dignified, which was the Jewish service at the time was not like that at all. Uh, you know, the, 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 the shuls were not known for their decorum or for their dignity the same way. They, you know, that was just the reality. So the reform were moving away from the old school, schleppy, orthodox, traditional kind of worship. And they figured the best way to do it is to emulate the non-Jew and therefore Decorum, dignity, organ, family seating, bareheadedness. So there's some truth uh, to the, the Taz's observation. And um, this is something that this is something that uh, that becomes accepted. The Mishnah Bura, right, offered them by the Chafetz Chaim, Rishomei or Cohen Kagan of Raden, source number nine, when he's talking about uh, the need to have one's hair covering. 
uh, head covered. They, so it talks about if you're traveling four amas, right? if you're walking six feet. So the Mishnah verse says, Midas chasidis afilu pafas midalad amas. Any time, less than six feet. Vafilu be'es hashina balayla, even wearing it at night, right? Sleep in a kippah, right? That's why those big kepalas that, you know, the Nachman ones that are, you know, will fit over the, that will stay in a person's head overnight, that's, uh, is, are helpful. And then he points out, so the, 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 the Mishnah Burr says, be strict, wear your head covering no matter how far you're walking and wear it all night long. And then he says, but some want to say that this is not really necessary, right? They want to say that this is not a, a, a religious obligation. This is not a legal practice. Only those who are more spiritually elevated. Right, those who are more modest, those who are more refined. So some would like to say that, and Mishnah Bur rejects that. For our kasav taz, this manenu isur gamur midina lios bagilu harosh vafilu yoshe viveso ayen shamatam. He says that the the taz, which was our source number eight, already said that it's prohibited. It's a legal prohibition to be sit with one's head uncovered, even in the home. And he writes there the reason. And we saw the reason. It's non-Jews are bareheaded. Uh, Jews are supposed to cover their head. Mr. Burr then continues, and this is just want to point this out because this relates to what we were talking about, whether about the hand or not. Obviously, you can't make a blessing or study Torah with an uncovered hand. It doesn't help to put your hand on your head. Because we're all part of the same body. You can't cover a body with another part of the body. It doesn't help. But maybe you could be lenient uh, when you're speaking in front of the Senate and you don't have, that's not what he says. Maybe you could be lenient when you, it's the middle of the night and you wake up and you're very thirsty and you have a glass of water next to you, and you want to take a sip, but you don't have anything on your head, you can be lenient in a case like that, in extreme circumstances. But better than just going like this and take in, in the drink would be to go like this. You take your sleeve and you put that on top of the head because that's not a part of your body covering a part of your body. This, your shirt is covering your head. I'm not sure whether David Schoen was thinking about that or not. Uh, you know, he seemed to have been very flustered by the whole situation, understandably so. Uh, but there is this idea, that, but the Mishnah Burr clearly points out that a lot of this, uh, there's room for leniency when you don't have the possibility and even mentions a, a precedent. Wake up in the middle of the night, need a glass of water, don't have a drink, put your hand on your head, that can suffice. And essentially it suffices because everyone admits that the legal foundation of this being binding uh, is only found amongst those who want to do a little bit extra, want to show additional level and awe and reverence, and it's for the Hasidim Harishonim, the early pious people and the like. The idea of this being a religious obligation, according to the Mishnah Bura, emerges mainly from, you can't be like the non-Jews. Non-Jews are bareheaded, Jews wear their yarmulkes, Jews wear their, cover their heads, um, you know, because this is how we differentiate ourselves. So this is a, a very different approach. It's not only about awe and reverence. If it was about awe and reverence, then depending on how a person, uh, how, how, how I, I'm not sure the word is awful, but how much, how full of awe or reverential a person is would determine whether or not they cover their head, as the Vilna Gon seems to be talking about. And now we have this idea that no, Jews cover their heads because non-Jews walk around bare. Uh, and that definitely has shifted the thinking that to, to the idea that Orthodox Jews are required to cover their head. Uh, yes, questions, comments. I had a question. Uh, say, I'm, I, this happened to me, I'm davening, and I'm up to Oleno. And the person next to me says, by the way, you dropped a yarmulke. Mm. So I'm davening the whole prayer without a yarmulke. So is it a, is it a reset to do the davening over? Or does it count that my davening went in without the yarmulke? Great question. So I think that, uh, as is often the case, machlokes, 
Uh, you have those who uh, require the person to daven again and those who say it's okay. I side with those who say it's okay um, because, again, it wasn't done intentionally. So that, that I think, I think a person who davens without a head covering uh, afterwards it, it becomes aware, he doesn't have to recite everything again. Um, because I think that, I think that as we are seeing, the sources don't, don't seem to have this initially as being prescribed Jewish behavior. It's all in reverential Jewish behavior. And so for that, there are different levels. It becomes more obligated or be able to explain it as an obligation when it's more about differentiation between the Jew and not appearing like the non-Jew. Where in and, the day, Tachat Kippat Hashemayim, I forgot where uh, it says. Tachat Kippat Hashemayim, where does it say that exactly? Tachat Kippat Hashemayim. Is that in the Torah? Uh, oh. I don't think that is a biblical, I don't think it's a Torah no. verse. It could be, it could be uh, Nevi'im or Tuvim. Okay. So the idea uh, of, um, the idea of this is the way of the non-Jew is evoked or is invoked by Rabbi Moshe Feinstein because Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was asked, and this is source number 10, if a person is permitted to take a job in a place where he'll have to be Begilui Rosh, he'll have to have uncovered head. Is that permissible or not? So we're probably, we, we know in practice that this is done. So, but what's the rationale? Pashuk Shem Mutar. It's certainly allowed because you don't have to lose money over this. As Rabbi Feinstein says, this is not a prohibition. It's not a rabbinic institution. It's a minhag tov. It's a nice custom. Right, Rabbi Feinstein dials back the language uh, from the Mishnah Bura and is, you know, is talking in practical terms. This is not an obligation. Even according to the Taz, right? This was the opinion that we saw that we should not be bareheaded because we should not follow the ways of the non-Jew. If that was the case, and this really was a problem because of that, there would be uh, uh, more, this would be more problematic and you may have to risk one's livelihood for this. Bahama Kamos. It's not clear. The Taz makes a good point, but it's not clear that this is 100% accurate and binding at all times. And it depends on the place. And Rabbi Feinstein says it's clearly in America, it's not a non Jewish law because most non Jews don't follow this law anyway and always uh, keep, uh, walk around bareheaded. Uh, it may be for religious services, they take off their hat, but he says that uh, th 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 this is not a religious practice uh, in America of non-Jews. So Jew walking around with uh, an uncovered head does not necessarily mean that the Jew is imitating Gentile practice. So Rabbi Fe Feinstein obviously uh, likes uh, the head covering, but feels that it's a situation where it's not possible. Uh, then it's not, a person does not have to forego working in such an environment. And really focusing on the fact that, that the, the nature of the covering is meant to be uh, a, a laudable practice rather than absolute obligation. And he pushes back against accepting the Taz uh, as normative in the way of acting the way, uh, the, the way that it's non-Jewish behavior uh, and that we're not allowed to follow in those ways. So that is, uh, we, we've now come full circle. We started with this idea that it was more uh, laudable behavior to do it, to, to cover the head. The Shulchan Aruch begins to institute that this is the law. Um, Vilna Gom pushes back, because where do you find this? The Taz provided rationale that this is how it's supposed to be done. Uh, Mishra Burr accepts this rationale. Rabbi Feinstein pushes back against this rationale. And if you look at the initial sources, it's uh, Minhag Tov. It's a good practice, you know, recognizing God is great, but it's not an absolute obligation. Um, before we Bye. finish, yeah, I Armin always used to love to quote uh, Rabbi Joseph Lukstein, who said, "A yarmulke is an indoor garment." Yes, and I'm sure you're being the uh, rabbi at KJ. You heard that a lot, uh, uh, and there well, were occasions yeah. where <laughs> we were uh, out here in the summer, and there was 
uh, unethical behavior that we encountered. And that would um, really prove the point to Armin. Well, correct. Well, look, you know, when, when identifiable observant Jews, you know, Jews who are identifiable by the way they're dressed, uh, do the wrong thing, that that, that, that definitely uh, is completely, as we would say in Yiddish, pumfa uh, of what the purpose is. The purpose of the head covering is to, to be reminded to act, in a, to act more morally, ethically, and in accordance with Judaism. So it's the opposite of it. Uh, in terms of you know, Joseph Lookstein, the ekipa as an indoor garment, I, you know, I think this actually ties into the, the, what, what Rosie mentioned before, the, the, the role of kippah as an expression of Jewish pride, because you know, the, 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 you know, I never uh, met Rabbi Joseph Lookstein, but I have heard Rabbi Haskell Lookstein uh, describe time and time again how in his lifetime, the posture of the Jew has, has shifted from the question mark to the exclamation point. The Jew being more, the Jew being more bent over and, and supplicant in front of the non-Jew versus standing tall and straight and proud, uh, and um, and uh, you know so even if you know, Rabbi Haskell looks seen is the bridge between the kippah's indoor garment uh, versus outdoor, um, you know, I think that Jewish pride has shifted a lot of this in terms of. This wearing the yarmulke is a sign. I wear my yarmulke. It's part of it's part of my Jewish activity. Uh, you know, I daven in the morning. I eat kosher food. I keep Shabbos and I wear a yarmulke. It's, be, it's for for some. It's become an expression of that uh, of that mindset. And you know, clearly, um, the, the the Jewish experience has shifted that. Uh, in I think I look Stein. Also, it was right after World War II, and it was Yorkville. And I think it had to do also with the kids going out in the street and not getting beaten up. Okay, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, look, that's certainly, a, that's certainly, a very good point. You know, uh, the reality. Look, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Lipstein often you invokes the Soviet Jewry movement, you know, with Jews going out and protesting and marching in the streets. You know, we are Jews, we couldn't be any prouder. If you can't hear us, we'll shout a little louder, right? That, that's definitely not, that's definitely not a turn of the 20th century attitude of the Jew. The that's not the, the, the attitude of the Jew. Uh, anywhere, you know, when, when was the last time the Jew, you know, stood up? You know, it, it, there's certainly uh, an element of it fitting into the ethos of the 1960s, you know, in, in the, the role of the counterculture and people acting in ways publicly that went against what had been done previously. You know, the, you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, you go further into the first half of the 20th century, you know, conformity, that was the name of the game. Uh, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about that. But anyone here see the movie Pleasantville? No. Yes. The movie Pleasantville. Was, I was yes. actually on the other day, and I was flipping through the idea of conformity, the ideas of things being black and white, the idea of things not having a certain passion or pride. Things were all, you know, stable. You know that that definitely changed. Now Judaism does provide provide some guidance into how that sometimes we do have to stick up. We do have to stand up and resist even uh, on things which might seem inconsequential. And that's uh, source number 11. Within the context of the discussion of how Judaism is a religion of life, right? We've discussed this before. If someone says, you know, transgress or I'll kill you, v'chai bahem. Judaism is about life. One has to be willing to trans you transgress. You don't die for Judaism, except the three cardinal sins, right? adultery, idolatry, murder, then that's when a person has to be willing to die for Judaism. So they, there's a discussion that they, 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 there's another time that maybe what Jew has to be willing to die, even if it's not such a big cardinal sin. In source number 11, Kiyasa, Rav Dimi, and Rav Yochanan, when Rav came from Israel to Babylonia, he said to Rav Yochanan, even when it is not a time of religious persecution, the sages said that one is permitted to transgress a prohibition in the face of mortal danger only when he's ordered to do so in private. But if he is ordered to commit a transgression in public, even if they threaten him with death, he does not transgress a minor mitzvah. He must be killed and not transgress. So in times of religious persecution, the Jew has to be willing to stand up for their religion and die for their religion when told uh, if, it, if it's in public. In private, it's one thing, right? They think about the, the Murano saga, right? They're living as non-Jews. Uh, you know, they're trying to they're, they're trying to survive. 
Um, and, and, but that was the situation. If they want you to transgress publicly, you have to be willing to die. Because some of them were executed for it and some of them lived as Muranos. But if it's a minor mitzvah, you can't, in public, you're not allowed to um, transgress. What's a minor mitzvah for this purpose? So the Gemara says, this is the top of the third page of sources. What is a minor mitzvah for this purpose? Rabbi Bar Yitzhak says, even to change the strap of a sandal. In the Aramaic, it's called araksa de misana, shoelaces. And that is, well, this means that if they, if they make a decree that for the sake of the religion, you have to tie your shoes a certain way, uh, then the Jew has to resist and tie it a different way. It, this idea of, there, there, there is a, a there, there comes a point when the Jew has to resist even on things very small, like the way a shoe is tied. There are situations when that, in, in times of religious persecution, when the authorities want you to embrace their idolatrous way of life by tying the shoe a certain way, the Jew is supposed to resist uh, and be willing to die for that. All right, it's, it, it's an extreme situation. It seems like, uh, you know, how, how does this and where does this emerge? But the, 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 the takeaway from this is that there are times that the Jew is meant to display a certain brazenness in a countercultural streak and be willing to act in a way that's different. And I think in, in, in many ways, you know, the, the, the yarmulke has come to represent that. It's a, it's a, it's a symbol of one's uh, commitment to one's observant Jewish way of life. Now, as Jeannie points out, it comes with responsibility. You know, if you are going to wear the yarmulke as a sign, you should be living that way and not just have it as a sign. But there is an element of, of, of pride that emerges. It becomes a symbol. Uh, it becomes a, a symbol. We start off by talking about this as a reverential concept. It's a sign about one's connection with God. Now, all of a sudden, we've almost, we've, we've stripped it of that. And it's become a symbol of one's affiliation to a certain way of life or connection to a certain way of life. And the way this seemed to you know, be completely turned on, it said a couple of years ago, you may have heard the story at the time, Source number 12, Germans march against anti-Semitism after Berlin attack on Israeli wearing a yarmulke. Thousands of Germans participate in spirited rallies to show their support for the country's Jewish community, protests against an ominous wave of anti-Semitism. Many protesters wore yarmulkes or skull caps to show their solidarity with the estimated 200,000 Jewish people in Germany. German non-Jews wearing yarmulkes to show solidarity with Jews. In an incident last week that helped launch the protest, an Israeli man wearing a yarmulke was assaulted in Berlin by a suspect authorities described as a 19-year-old Syrian man seeking asylum. The suspect allegedly beat the man with the belt and shouted Yehudi, the Arab word for Jew, also the Hebrew word for Jew. The victim, Adam Armush, told German television he's a non-Jewish Israeli citizen from Haifa and was wearing the yarmulke to demonstrate to a friend that Berlin was not anti-Semitic. He's not wearing it because he believes in it. He's, he was wearing it to, uh, as, uh, to, to show that it's a Jewish symbol that can walk freely in Berlin. And of course, he was proven wrong, was beaten. And now all the non-Jewish Germans are wearing yarmulkes in solidarity. So there's, we, we've entered a different phase into the yarmulke. It was a sign of religious, uh, striving for religious excellence and spirituality and reverence to you being part of the Jewish male uniform regulations, even though, as many pointed out, it's not really so clear that this is really a binding obligation. Uh, the Taz introduced it as the idea that we're countering the non-Jewish bareheadedness. This caught on. Mishnah Burra likes this idea and makes it normative that the, it becomes a rule and an obligation. Rabbi Feinstein pushes back, pushes back against us and tries to put it back in its proper place. Obviously a nice thing, but uh, not uh, absolutely obligatory, but we've seen that in contemporary times, it's become a, a symbol of the Jewish adherence and Jewish pride uh, in a certain way that uh, even it becomes a symbol for non-observant Jews to show Judaism or for non-Jews to show solidarity with Judaism. So um, and this is clearly now much more in the news because of David Schoen's behavior. And uh, so thank you for giving us something to talk about this morning. Uh, but again, we have this idea of uh, it, 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 the, the concept reminds us of our need to have a, a approach, have a certain sense of own reverence when it comes to before God, as well as what are our religious obligations and requirements when it comes to covering your head for davening and the like, or uh, in contemporary times, it's, it's uh, impact or the way it affects our understanding of Jewish pride. And so with that, happy to turn it over to